Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have seen how after the Mughals most princely states in India started building in the style of the Mughals the architectural vocabulary of the Mughals was completely replicated by the Rajputs, by the Marathas, by all kings, large and small, across India. But it was not always the case that the Mughal style was so widely accepted. In fact, contemporary with the Mughals in many parts of the India were various sultanates. We shall today look at the Deccan sultanates and see how they shaped the architecture of the early Maratha state. Even though the early Marathas, which is to say from the late 16th century into the early 17th century, are contemporary with the great Mughals, the architectural idiom that they follow is that of the Deccan Sultanates. Notably, the Adil Shahs of Bijapur, the Nizam Shahs of Ahmadnagar, the Qutub Shahs of Golconda, and the Sultanate that preceded all of them, the Bahmanis of Bidar and Gulparga. But what was the architecture of the region of the northwestern Deccan before the Sultanates come to power? And we have seen this in the temple at Anva. But we will look at other Yadava temples such as the one at Jhorge and also a set of temples in a small town called Loni Bhapkar outside of Pune. The Yadavas completely embraced the Bhumija style of architecture. They were champions of it. In many ways, they thought that this was a style that was unique to them. It was their identity. Temples such as this that they built in the Bhumija style became hallmarks not just for the style but also of Yadava power. And somewhere in the residual memory of northwestern Maharashtra, this stayed on even after the great age of temple building was gone, even after the Sultanates came in. As we saw in the example at Anva, temple builders who built temples for the Yadavas were also building buildings for the new powers that came in the 13th and 14th century. That is first the Delhi Sultanate and then regional Sultanates. These temples that the Yadavas built were eventually revived in the 18th century by a group of new kingdoms collectively called the Maratha Confederacy. But the Bhumija temple of the Yadavas never really went away. It became the identity of the whole region. If you look at temples at places like Loni Bhapkar, a temple built in the 13th century, very late in the Yadava rule, borrowing on motifs from Gujarat like the temple at Anva. Here you see the Jalis in the front that seem to be copying Jalis that you see in similar temples in Gujarat. But note the change in form. The complete front facade of the Sabha Mandapa has become tripartite. It has three parts separated by columns. It has these three parts because the dome on top is a corbel dome. And when you have three bay divisions, it is possible to have diagonal beams create an octagon in which this corbel dome will be built. Also notice that the two side walls have massive buttresses that flank the Sabha Mandapa of the temple. From the side, the temple starts having small turrets, four small finials at the corners of the Sabha Mandapa, something that we will see in the Sultanate architecture of the region later. So here you have a corbel dome with four finials at the four corners. Again, a form that first the Sultanates and later the early Maratha temple builders will completely embrace. Also notice that the superstructure is built completely in brick. 
whereas the base is in stone. This is a region that is rich in stone. It is not that there is any shortage. Then why this choice of brick? Perhaps to have greater control over the small decorative elements in the shikhara. Again, here is a detail of the interface between the stone and the brick on top. Once you have temples built in brick, they would be plastered over and perhaps painted. Stone was not plastered over or painted because it had a very fine finish that could serve as ornament by itself. There are other temples in the village which have been massively redone in the 18th, 19th and 20th century. But we can see by the overall form that these are also Yadava temples. In fact, if you look at this and if you realize that what you see are bands running up the sides with small edicules that connect them in horizontal tiers, you will recognize this too as nothing more than a Bhumija temple of modest proportion, possibly dating back to the Yadava period, in this case we know it is, but which has been completely redone in the Maratha period. And the clue that this was redone in the Maratha period is the bulbous dome on top. The Amlakas in the Maratha period get transformed into domes. And the reason is the dome has been used by the Sultanates for at least 300 years before that. This is how builders know what needs to be built on top of buildings. Another temple in the same town is that of Bhairavnath and this temple is extraordinary because it appears to be completely a late Maratha temple. If you look at the Sabha Mandapa in front, again it has some kind of domical vault and four finials in the four corners. In the courtyard of the temple are these two big Deepamalas, a feature associated with temples in the Deccan for over 400 years. If you look at the temple, you can start seeing that it is actually a Yadava temple. It has all the features of a Yadava temple that we saw earlier, namely a tripartite facade, big buttress walls on the side, and if you look at close-ups of the columns, and not just of the columns, but also the ornamental details, they are completely Yadava. Yet, this temple was given a complete makeover in the 18th century under the Marathas. And what you see above the cornice line is all a new reconstruction. But it is not just above the cornice line. If you look at the complete facade of the temple, what you realize that an older Yadava temple has been completely encased within a new Maratha finished Sabha Mandapa and Sanctum. And how do we know this is from the Maratha period? It's because there are no offsets like you see in Yadava temples. The plan has no complications. It is a set of two simple cubes connected by an antarala or a passage. So, you have the cube of the sanctum on your left and a larger cube of the Sabha Mandapa on your right. The Sabha Mandapa has four corner finials like we saw in late Yadava temples, but the superstructure is completely new. In fact, even the bottom is completely new. It is the inside which is Yadava in this case. And again, to give you a flavor of the new kinds of 18th century Maratha temples, something uh, that we will look at in some detail later in the class. In this temple complex is also a bell and a number of temples in the northwestern Deccan have bells brought back as trophies from Portuguese churches in the mid 18th century by the forces of the Peshwa. And once you get inside the temple, you start seeing that the columns of the temple and the ornament on it is completely from the Yadava period. These are not Maratha columns. This is an older, possibly derelict Yadava temple that is completely encased within a new Maratha temple. 
And therefore, when we start looking at early Maratha temples, what you see is two major influences, that of the Yadavas and also of the Deccan Sultanates. The Yadavas are gone by the 1350s in terms of exerting any kind of architectural influence. What survives is something that survives in collective memory. But the Sultanates for the next few hundred years will actively promote certain kinds of architectural programs that shape temple building in later years. The Marathas emerge in the mid 17th century under Chhatrapati Shivaji who starts off with a small kingdom on the western strip of peninsular India. Within 20 years his kingdom expands significantly but is still minor as compared to the larger Mughal empire. When he dies, he leaves behind a very strong foundation that is assertive in terms of what style they will build in, what language they will use and what their mission is in terms of a Swarajya or self-rule. After all, this is an indigenous movement brought about to empower people who belong to the region. The Maratha empire will eventually become will grow out of this kingdom and cover and control a large part of central and north India as well, taking over, filling up a power vacuum left behind by the weakened Mughals. But before the Marathas, what you have in this region is a group of five sultanates, all successors of a sultanate called the Bahamani Sultanate. In fact, Shivaji's grandfather on both sides work for these sultanates as do a lot of Marathas. Here you have a painting in which most probably an imaginary encounter in which you have major Maratha chieftains such as Shahaji in obeisance to the Adil Shah Sultan. In fact, the sultans have started using Marathi as their court language as you start seeing in their official documents. The sultanates themselves have espoused a local culture. They themselves have become local. But they are still beholden to ideas of a Persian at court culture. And it is this that Shivaji tries to completely change. But he comes with a long pedigree of families who served the various sultanates and have become Persianized in their many years of service. Here you have both of Shivaji's parents uh, and his grandparents whom you see all serve the Nizam Shahi Sultanate. What they built themselves, his two grandfathers, are these two tombs which look like tombs of the Sultans and their Muslim courtiers. Of course, they are not tombs because as Hindus they did not get buried they were cremated and therefore these are samadhis or memorials. If you see Shivaji's maternal grandfather who controlled this small fief of Sindhked Raja up in the northern Deccan, the family had it for about 100 years in which they built several buildings that are very important. But if you look at these buildings by themselves, there is nothing to tell that they are actually different from the sultanate architecture in the region. Here you have a half built fort that they had started on but their lands were eventually taken away in the 1650s. One of the things they build is a massive dam and the dam has subterranean chambers into which one can go and sit and relax in hot weather and watch the water flow by. Well, the idea of such a dam is not new. We have already seen this with the Adil Shah Sultans at the fort of Naldurg, where they built themselves a similar dam, of course, on a much larger scale, in which you have chambers in the wall where one can sit and watch cascades of water fall over. You also have in Sindhked Raja a number of these pavilions which stand in the middle of lakes and the only way to get there is to boat across. Again, an idea that you find 
in the various sultanates of the Deccan. You have it in Ahmednagar and you have it with the Imad Shahs of Elichpur, palace pavilions that stand in the middle of lakes which can be approached only by boating through water. If you look at the pal palatial mansion, the fortified mansion, the Gadi of the Jadhavs at Sinkhed Raja, this is Shivaji's maternal grandfather. Again, nothing to suggest that this is anything more Hindu than it is Muslim. It is just a fortified mansion of its period, following the latest fashions of architecture. Inside you have now a restored but uh, you know, true to form loggia in one of the walls using a structural form that you see replicated again across all the sultanates of the Deccan. Again, this is to say that everybody builds in the same style, the architects and the designers are used to building a certain way. All of it is local and naturalized over a period of time, even if the ideas come from elsewhere to begin with. And then finally, the greatest architectural work in Sindhkhed Raja is the memorial built by Shivaji's grandfather Lakhuji Jadhav Rao for himself, in which his sons are also buried and around which are a number of other memorials built for members of his family. These are the small memorials which are placed around the big Samadhi of Lakhuji Jadhav. But where does this idea of having one major memorial surrounded by smaller memorials really come from? And we shall take a look at that as well. If you look at the ornamental program on the memorial of Lakhuji Jadhav, you will again find motifs that are very similar to what you find on Sultanate buildings in this period. Very little of this is actually Mughal. Look at the column that you see on your left with those splayed legs, something that you will find in Bijapur, in Golconda and in Ahmednagar. Look at the fish in the spandrels holding up those rosettes, something you will find in Bahmani architecture. Look at the pendant chains that you see right here, which you find in all the royal architecture of the Nizam Shahs, the Adil Shahs and also of people who assume power like Malikambar. Again, comparisons with Adil Shahi architecture, this is from the Golgumbas. And very close by, at a site called Deulgaon Raja, you have another branch of the Jadhav family, which bids for itself a number of memorials, including this one built for a lady of the house. And if this building were to be shown with no context, one could easily think it was built by the sultans for one of their own. It has all the features of a sultanate building in the Deccan. Again, compare the splayed legs. You can't see it too well in the picture on the right, but this is the Jal Mandir in Bijapur, which has exactly the same legs. In fact, if the building on your left was two-story tall, it would resemble the building on the right quite a bit. The other memorial, which is Shivaji's paternal grandfather's, is outside the village of Verul, that is to say the famous Elora Caves, which was their fief. And if you look at a tomb like this, it's exactly like the Islamic tombs built in this period. In fact, this is one of three memorials of which one is an Islamic tomb and the other two are not, which are placed around the temple of Grishneshwar, one of the twelve Jyotirlingas. This is the temple of Grishneshwar, which you can see is built in a revival Bhumija style by the great Ahilya Bai Holkar, who went around the country restoring and repairing temples. This is not Yadava Bhumija. It is a copy of the Yadava Bhumija and it does have on top not an Amlaka but an Islamic dome. Here are the three memorials or tombs which are placed around the temple at Grishneshwar. 
just a few kilometers up north is the holy site of Khuldabad where a lot of saints in the Deccan are buried and it is around these saints that a lot of rulers also had themselves buried. This idea that a holy place has divine power and you have a burial or a memorial to yourself around such a place is something picked up from the Sultanates by the Marathas and which they embody in such a site. If you look at the doors, there is one true doorway and the other three doorways on the sides of this memorial mimic the real wooden doorway. But these doorways are not unlike again what you see at the Gol Gumbas in, B I mean, in Bijapur or also at the Ibrahim Rauza. The ornament is completely borrowed from tombs of various sultanates. What you can see here are again the same forms of splayed legs. One of the memorials is actually a tomb. The decoration again is borrowing heavily from the Deccan Sultanates. What's interesting is you have a number of completely unidentified buildings in the whole region which have always been assumed as Muslim buildings. It is very likely that these also might have belonged to Maratha noblemen at some point. After all, just looking at a building, you cannot tell whether it's built for a Hindu or a Muslim because the early Marathas being completely imbricated within the Sultanate court culture are building for themselves and commissioning for themselves architecture that looks like it is built by the Sultans. The Faruqis of Thalner also build themselves a set of tombs which you see on your right and what you see on the left is a memorial at Krishneshwar at Ellora. Again more examples of the kinds of ornament and decoration you will see. And this is the disposition of the three memorials around the temple, something that you see at Khuldabad just a few kilometers away. Well, those are all the early Marathas who served at the courts of the Sultanates. But now we'll see a building which is built by Shivaji himself, Shivaji who proudly never served at the court of the Adil Shah, the Nizam Shah, the Qutub Shah or the Mughal. Somebody who asserted that his regionalism should be given an identity in form by using a vocabulary that's different, by writing letters in only the Modi script, by building a revival Hindu kingdom. But let's look at the temple he builds on the occasion of his coronation in a new fort that he builds for himself. And this is the temple, the temple of Jagdishwara, which from a distance resembles a mosque more than it does a temple. Very close up, it does not follow any of the classical proportions of a Hindu temple. In fact, this will be similar to what you will see with Maratha temples, two cubes, one of the sanctum and one of the Sabha Mandapa that are put together the superstructure is another matter altogether. Notice the corners are marked by finials and the sanctum is marked by a dome. In terms of proportions of this building, it more resembles something like the gatehouse of the Ibrahim Raza in Bijapur. If you look on top of this temple, what you see is a dome with minarets. The dome does not look like a temple spire and if you look at the entrance to the temple above the Ganesha that you find on the doorway you find in between a trellis grill, a jali in relief and two flanking minarets that take you in. But in the same complex you also do find other temples that are copying what is the Shekhari style from North India. And so when Shivaji builds himself a temple that looks like Deccani Sultanate architecture, it is not that 
he is unaware of other kinds of temples being built elsewhere. It is a very conscious choice to build in the idiom of the region. And this region has had this architecture for 300 years. This is local architecture. This is not imported architecture. This really belongs here. We might call it Sultanate, but it is equally early Maratha. Thank you.